I'm sat here in my house in Reading. Um, I'm told it's quite cold in Nairobi, but it's quite warm here in Reading, so I'm feeling quite happy about that. Anyway, um, so I'm from the University of Reading, the Global Recruitment and Admissions team, um, and it's my job to give advice to students in Sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world about studying here at Reading. Um, I've been here for about three years. I live very close to the campus um, and I walk around the campus most days, so I can absolutely tell you that it's a wonderful place, um, wonderful community to be in. So. Today's session, we're going to cover a few different topics, and I know that some of you on the call today might have already applied to Reading, and you might have your offer, and you're thinking about um, joining us this September, and there might be some of you that are yet to apply, you're just interested, um, you've heard a bit about us, and you'd like to find out more, so I'm going to give you all a brief um, intro to, to Reading, I'm going to tell you a bit about our rankings, the research, life on campus, including accommodation, um, general entry requirements, um, the scholarships that we offer, what our plans are for teaching this autumn, because um, I'm sure that lots of you are quite keen to know how that will be delivered, and then next steps. So, uh, as Alicia said, please do submit your questions. Um, I'm quite sure that I'll cover most of the topics that you might think to ask a question about. So please, I would rather you wait until the end, because you will probably find the answer to your question as we go through the presentation, which will take about 20, 25 minutes. So without further ado, let's get started. So for those of you that don't know much about Reading, we're, we're a public university um, and we're based just outside of London in the southeast of England. And we started life about 125 years ago um, as Reading College, and we were part of the University of Oxford. So an extension college offering higher education programmes under the badge of um, Oxford University, but in the Reading area. So um, we're a university with strong traditions, got a strong background, um, and we're, we're quite well known for um, having strengths in a few different subject areas, which I'll tell you more about in a moment. Some other interesting, hopefully you find them interesting facts about Reading. Um, we were the only university to actually be given the Royal Charter between the First and Second World War. Um, so that's quite a, a good uh, accomplishment, I would say, uh, given the situation that was happening um, over on this side of the world. Um, we've been around for quite some time, which means we've educated quite a number of students. So. Um, 150,000 um, students from more than 180 different countries have been studied and graduated from Reading. So we have a huge alumni network across the world. And what's an even more interesting fact is that our first international student joined the university in 1908 and they came Sorry, guys, it looks like we have lost Chris. I think his internet has just gone. Just give us a couple of minutes and we will resume where we've left off.
Hi guys, uh, I'm hoping you can hear me. Chris is ah, Chris is back. And he's on mute. <laughs> okay, good. Sorry about that. I think it was probably my internet, but that's the reality of the world we live in, working from home, and I can't always rely on a stable internet connection. Okay, let me just share my screen again, just so that you can see what I'm looking at. Um, can you see that okay? Yeah, we're back. Perfect. Okay, so I was just finishing up um, to let you know a bit about the campus and the amazing green space that we have. So um, our White Knights campus, which I'll show you in just a moment, has won 10 awards in the last 10 years making it one of the, the top university green spaces in the UK. Um, I'm pretty sure you'll agree with me when I show you a couple of pictures, you'll see why. In terms of location, we're quite enviously placed in a nice part of the country. Um, we're super close to London, which is obviously the capital. Um, so less than 25 minutes by train from Reading into central London. Um, it's about 40 minutes from Reading to London Heathrow Airport, which is um, the biggest, one of the biggest airports here in the UK um, that flies all around the world. Um, and we're about one hour, 30 minutes from Gatwick Airport. Um, so really easily connected to the city, uh, to the capital and to other parts of the UK like Oxford, as well as um, internationally. Um, we have, well, we're home to the Thames Valley Park. It's often referred to as TVP, um, but this is what we call the UK's version of the Valley. So it's a big business park just outside the Reading Town Centre, and it's got some really quite prestigious, well-known international firms. So Microsoft, Oracle, Huawei, Siemens, some of those big tech companies um, have headquarters um, and bases here in Reading. Uh, lots of other companies in and around the town centre, um, so Deloitte, KPMG, um, as well as lots of other um, industries. So it's really good for students to connect in terms of work placements, graduate employment, um, and just to be in a part of the, the country that's well known for its economic output. So a bit more about the campuses. Um, for those of you that don't know, we have quite a few different campuses. Um, White Knights is our main campus um, just outside the Reading Town Centre. Um, so we call ourselves an urban university because we're very much in and around the town centre. It's just a very short walk away, but the campus itself is beautiful. It's big and it's green. Um, it's got lots of wildlife. We have a huge lake on the campus. Um, so if you're on Instagram, head over to the University of Reading Instagram page and you'll see our social media team that are always posting some really cool pictures of wildlife on campus. Um, the picture that you can see underneath White Knights is the library. It's just had a major refurbishment. £60 million has gone into the refurbishment. So it's looking really modern, um, but we also have lots of beautiful listed buildings on the campus as well. Now the London campus is short away from White Knights. It's a much smaller campus, but it's where the university began life. And the image that you can see below is the Great Hall. Um, it's a beautiful big Victorian building, which is where we host our graduation every year. Um, if you're studying architecture or education, you'd also be based on campus. A lot of the subject areas will be based on the White Knights campus. Um, our business school um, is based on the White Knights campus, but they also have another campus which is in Henley-on-Thames, um, which is a beautiful um, town just outside of Reading. Uh, we also have a, a campus in Malaya. So we offer some of our foundation undergraduate, postgraduate programs in Malaysia. And some of you might also know that our business school, so Henley Business School has a campus in South Africa. So again, we're really well connected globally, uh, but especially on the African subcontinent. As promised, here's a picture of White Knights campus. Um, I really hope you agree with me when I say that it's just a truly wonderful space. 
Um, it's so green, it's so tranquil, but it's a campus that has a real community feel. Um, the picture that you can see is about three quarters of the campus. So where you've got the lake, there's even more buildings just across the other side. Um, we've got lots of accommodation on campus, but what I want you to get from this image is we are a campus university in the, the heart of the town, very close to London. Um, a lot of the faculties are based on this campus, accommodation, lots of other social leisure spaces here as well. Uh, just to give you an idea of the scale, if you were to walk from one side of the campus to another, it would take you about 20 to 25 minutes, depending on the route that you take. Um, but you're guaranteed to see some very old trees that are very um, protected in this country, some wildlife um, and lots of students from all over the world. So for those of you that don't know about our academic structure, um, we have more than 250 different undergraduate and postgraduate programmes that you could study. Um, and I've just listed the main subject areas here on the presentation slide. Um, within each of these subject areas, there's lots of sub degrees. Um, there's lots of joint honours where you could combine two programmes together if you're studying at undergraduate level. Um, and we have lots of postgraduate programmes. Um, if you're interested in taught master's programmes, or if you're interested in studying a PhD. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about all of the individual programmes that we have, but if you see something there of interest, then do make sure that you head over to our website, which has so much information. You can learn about all the modules that you'll study on the programme, um, who will be teaching you, the kind of research interests of the faculty, and it will help you to build up an idea of what it would be like to study here with us. Now, we're really proud of our rankings. Um, so we are a top 30 UK university in terms of world rankings. And what that basically means is out of the 90 universities that are in the QS world rankings, we're the 27th highest UK university. Um, a bit more context, if we're looking at all of the universities in the QS rankings, we're currently ranked number 202. Um, so that's looking at universities across the whole of the world. On the right hand side of the slide, I've just listed some of the subject areas that are in the UK top 20. Um, and this is in the Complete University Guide 2022. Um, so it's very much up to date, but you'll see that lots of our subject areas feature um, quite highly in the UK. So we're really proud of all of our programmes, but especially proud of these programmes that have been recognised for their, their excellence. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, and I know that for some of you this might not be relevant, but we are home to the Henley Business School, which is a very prestigious and one of the oldest business schools in the UK. It's also part of the elite group of business schools that has a triple accreditation. Um, so that's Amber Equus and AACSB. So these are the three main accrediting bodies of business schools globally. Um, so it really does put the Henley Business School in that top tier in terms of excellence and quality. Within the business school, we have the ICMA Centre. Um, and this is um, the center that provides um, training and education to students interested in um, pure finance. So we have trading simulation rooms um, with 100 terminals and they're sponsored by Thomson Reuters and Bloomberg. So um, students that study with us are studying in that kind of industry standard um, environment. Uh, in terms of some other rankings for Henley, um, for those of you interested in land and property management, so things like real estate, um, we're ranked number two in the UK. If you're interested in the executive MBA, we're number three in the UK. Masters in finance and masters in management both ranked seventh and eighth. So we really are uh, really quite up there in terms of our ranking for business related programs. 
Um, Reading isn't part of the Russell Group um, universities, but we are very much known for our world-leading research. Um, 98% of our research is classified as being of international standing. Um, so that's an amazing achievement. And that was based on the, the latest research excellence framework that took place in 2014. There's some other stats here, uh, 19th in the UK for the, the research intensity, so how much research we do, um, 24th for the amount of income that we receive from research councils. So these are research councils and organisations that come to us and want to give us money to conduct research on their behalf. And then 27th in the UK for the power of our research. And then just to give you an idea, there's about 135 um, universities in the UK. So it does put us in that top um, quartile of um, research intensive universities. Now, not all of you here today are going to be interested in studying climate sciences, but I hope you'll all agree that it's something that affects every single one of us in our lives. Um, now, Reading is a world authority and absolutely leading the way in terms of climate science, um, education and research. Um, I don't know if many of you have seen the climate stripes that you can see at the bottom of my slide. Many of you might have seen these in the news last week um, because it was one of the, the pivotal moments of the year in terms of climate change. But it was actually a professor at the University of Reading, um, Ed Hawkins. He's still with us. He used um, this Show Your Stripes, which is what it's called, as a campaign to really get people to understand the rise in annual temperature in the world. So if you haven't looked at it before, just head over to the website, straight, show your stripes. Um, you can even download the stripes uh, so that you can see how the temperature in Nairobi, if you're in Nairobi, has changed year over year um, over the last 100 years. Um, Related to that, uh, and I know that this is a really popular subject area for students in Kenya, um, but we're actually ranked 12th in the world for uh, agriculture and forestry based on the QS world rankings. 12th in the world, but the, the highest UK university. So we really are top of, top of the, the, the class when it comes to education and research in food, agriculture and health. Um, and our researchers and academics are trying to tackle some of the biggest global issues like climate change, hunger, poverty, diet and health. So if you're interested in a program in this area, then you're definitely coming to the place. So just to give you a bit more about uh, a bit more insight into what it's like to live on campus, um, as I showed you before, the campus is vast. Um, we have so many facilities for students to benefit from on the campus. First of all, all of your teaching space, so the faculty, your accommodation, the library center of the campus. We have cafes and restaurants in uh, different parts of the campus, um, offering reduced price um, food to university students and staff. We even have our own supermarket in the center of the campus, um, so you don't have to go far to get your groceries. Um, we have a hotel, so um, if you ever have any friends or family that want to visit, they can actually stay on the campus. Um, Santander have a branch on the campus, so it's very easy for you to pop in there when you arrive to open a student bank account. Uh, and then in terms of entertainment, we have our own nightclub, which is called 360. Um, we have Park House Pub, which is a beautiful Victorian brick, brick, brick building. Um, with seating inside and outside, um, but lots of places to socialise. And then on a more practical level, um, on the campus, we have a nursery and a preschool. Um, and very close to the campus, we have the University Medical Centre um, and a dentist, which obviously um, advise all students to register with as soon as you arrive in the UK. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about sports in a moment, but we have... Um, lots of sports facilities and you've seen the size and the greenness of our campus so lots of those facilities are outside and all students can benefit from those. Now we know that coming to the UK is 
quite a, a big ordeal for some students if you maybe have never been outside of your home country before um, you've never lived on your own before uh, and you're coming here alone um, we know that it can be quite daunting uh, and that's why we invest so much time and money into the support that we provide all of our students but specifically our international students um, so for those whose uh, English is not their first language which I know is not the case in Kenya um, but we do offer a free academic English program, so it helps students to enhance their English language and academic skills. Um, we offer a mentorship scheme, so this is called our mentor. Um, so you will be, if you're an undergraduate student coming to Reading, you will automatically be assigned uh, a mentor that will contact you and work with you during the first few months that you um, come into the UK. Um, if you're a post graduate student then you can apply to have a mentor if you so wish uh, and then just basically guide you through those first months and help you answer those kind of questions that maybe you don't want to ask an academic and you just want to ask a fellow student so you know how do I open a bank account or where's the best place to find the Chinese takeaway that kind of stuff we're also super proud of our careers service um, and careers is a huge focus for universities in the UK, but especially here at Reading. Um, our careers team were um, award winners uh, in, term, in terms of the Times Higher Education Awards in 2017. Um, we have a central careers team that works across the whole of the university, putting on events annually, so graduate internship fairs, um, volunteering fairs, um, part-time work um, we also have careers consultants that work within each of the academic schools as well um, so there's lots of support available um, to help you with writing your cv interview tips and techniques uh, and what we're especially proud of is campus jobs so the university has its own company called campus jobs that provides paid work to our own students and our motto is if a student can do a work then the student should do a work to give you a bit of perspective um, last year we paid our students more than a million pounds in wages to work on behalf of the university and that's lots of different jobs so working in our um, hospitality so in a bar or a restaurant or a coffee shop um, doing some clerical work in um, our administrative departments, as well as helping at Open Day, we have the UniBuddy platform where we employ our own students to answer questions from prospective students. So we're trying to give you that real authentic experience of getting to know what it's like to be a student. Uh, in terms of more of the social side of things, uh, RUSU, which is the Reading University Students' Union, um, RUSU are there to provide all of your kind of pastoral support outside of the university. The Students' Union is independent, but part of the university, help, it's part funded by the university, but they're there to have your interests um, at the forefront. RUSU are the people that organise all of the clubs and societies. Um, so if you're interested in joining a sports club, uh, then you can, or a cultural society, if you have an interest. There's more than 150 different sport clubs and societies you can already join. And if there isn't one there that interests you and you want to set your own up, then you have to work with that. And the student union is there to help support you through that process. So as I said to you, um, we have um, sports facilities on campus, and I know that for lots of students, sport is a, a really important part of studying um, and student life. In the UK, we're quite serious about sport, maybe not quite so serious as uh, the universities in, in the US, but sport's pretty much one of the, the kind of core ethics of studying in the UK. So generally on Wednesdays, uh, during term time, there are no classes and Wednesdays dedicated to sports. Um, this is generally when the sport teams play against other universities. So you can see here, we've got an American football team, we've got our own rugby team, and they will play other universities in, in the UK um, in what we call the Bucks League. 
Um, we've got some indoor sports facilities. We've got outdoor sports. We've got our own gym, which students have a very membership for. Um, but if you're not interested in joining a sports club to play in a team, you can just join a sports club to meet other people, for exercise, or, or just because it's an interest. Now, accommodation's very important for international students, um, and you're probably quite unfamiliar with how it works in the UK, but we're here to help you through that, and UNICEF, who are hosting this event today, can also tell you a bit more about what it's like to, to live in student accommodation. But here at Reading, we have um, almost 5,000 rooms on our White Knights campus alone, um, so we can cater for a huge number of students um, every year. We've got different types of accommodation based on um, price. So um, the prices start from about £133 per week. Um, and we have rooms that have um, shared bathroom facilities. You can have your own ensuite. You can live in a studio. You can live in your own apartment. Um, and there's options for you to have your meals included. Or if you're more interested in cooking your own food, then self-catered options. I don't want to go into too much detail today about accommodation because there are so many options. But if you are an offer holder um, and you're interested in knowing a bit more, head over to um, the Me at Reading applicant portal, which you have all the details for, and all of the information that you need about accommodation is available there. If you haven't applied yet, then as soon as you have applied, you've been made an offer, then you'll have access to the Me at Reading portal. And this is where we basically host all of the information that we think you need to know to help you um, navigate your journey through to enrolment here at the university. Uh, here's just one of the, the images of our halls of residence. This is one of the oldest on the campus and it's based on the old Oxford University model. Um, so it's called Wantage Hall. It's very old, very beautiful. Um, but not all of our accommodation is like this. Uh, if you have a look on the website, you'll see that we've got some super modern accommodation that's kind of more open plan living, um, ensuite rooms. Um, so yeah, everyone has their own preference. Um, and I know that lots of international students would love to come to the UK and feel that they're having that kind of Harry Potter experience. If that's what you're interested in, Wanted Tool is definitely the place for you to live. So uh, for those of you that haven't already applied, I, I just wanted to give a bit of information about uh, entry requirements, so how you can actually gain a place here at the university. Uh, now, if you're a student interested in studying a bachelor's degree, then there's different qualifications that you can apply with. Um, so if you're studying A-levels in an international school or the International Baccalaureate, then all of those grades are published on the individual course pages of our website. Um, generally, most of our courses would require you to have an A and two Bs in your A-levels uh, or between 30 and 32 points in your international baccalaureate. If you're applying with your KCSEs, um, then you would need to study our International Foundation programme first. Just to give you a bit more information about that, um, in Kenya, um, I know that you only study at school for 12 years, whereas in the UK, we study for 13 years. So students in the UK will study 13 years and go straight to a bachelor's degree. Because you're only studying for 12 years, um, we need to give you that extra year to, to develop your subject knowledge, to develop your academic skills. And that's what the International Foundation Programme is designed for. So it's a one year, nine month program that um, you will study on a pathway on the basis of the bachelor degree that you want to progress to. Uh, and you'll be taught on our campus by our staff um, to give you that foundation knowledge in your subject area um, and study in academic skills. Now, another, just gonna take one sip of drink. Um, something that we're quite pleased about, um, and I know the students in Kenya are really happy about too, is that you don't actually have to supply an IELTS test or any other kind of English language test. If you study KCSE uh, and you meet our criteria, so in terms of the degrees that we require, 
then you can use your KCSE as proof of your English language ability. So this satisfies our admissions criteria, and it will also satisfy the um, immigration uh, criteria as well. <clears throat> that is, unless you're studying on an international foundation program, the government in the UK, the Home Office, they require you to take a specific version of the IELTS um, test. Uh, if you're unsure about any of that, then you can contact uh, myself and my contact details will be available at the end of the presentation. Um, or you can contact uh, one of the counsellors at Agnav. If you're interested in a postgraduate programme, um, so a master's degree, most of our programmes you would be needing to get a 2-1 or a 2-2 um, from your undergraduate studies in Kenya. Now, you might study at a university that has um, uh, the grading system on a GPA scale. That's absolutely fine. Um, the best thing to do is inquire with us first. Um, if you already have your qualifications, just to make sure that you meet those requirements. And I'm very happy to, to receive um, information like that by email and I can advise you. Um, or you can just apply directly, submitting information about your qualifications and then our admissions team will assess you and uh, hopefully make you an offer if you meet all of the conditions. Just be sure that you submit all of your qualifications, so even your KCSE, um, so that we can make sure that you meet the English language requirement. Um, if, if you're interested in a, a studying a PhD with us, then for most of our subjects, you'd need to have a good bachelor's degree, so a, a second class um, in the upper division bachelor's degree plus a master's degree in a related field for some of our subjects. Um, it is possible for you to come directly with a bachelor's degree to a PhD, um, but we find that most students will come to us for a PhD having already studied a master's. Um, it's not necessary for you to have a PhD proposal, so a research proposal um, done ahead of applying. If you aren't quite sure what you want to study, then take a look at our graduate school website and we have listed lots of different opportunities. So actual re research projects that we're looking for students to come and research with us. But if you do have a good idea of what you would like to study, then you can apply to us and we'll um, ask you to submit your research proposal. It's normally good practice to reach out to um, academic stuff from within the department that you're interested in studying. So my advice right now, if you're interested in studying a PhD with us, is get in contact with me directly and I can send you some information about who to contact and where to find that information across our website. Now, I know that scholarships is a really uh, key part of studying in, in the UK, of studying abroad for lots of students. Um, I'm pleased to say that we do have some awards, um, but I have to say at this stage, we don't offer as a university full scholarships um, to any students. We do work with external organisations that offer full scholarships. Um, we have agreements with those organisations um, where we admit students uh, who are awarded full scholarships from organisations such as uh, the Commonwealth, uh, Chevening, which are part of the Foreign and Commonwealth um, Office here in the UK. As you can imagine, offering full tuition fee discounts and sometimes stipends for living costs means that those scholarship schemes are incredibly competitive. So um, if you apply and you don't get a scholarship the first time, then please apply, apply, apply again in the future. I've met students in the last two years who have applied four, five, six times year after year for their Commonwealth Achieving Scholarship and they've now been awarded it. So that hard work and determination definitely pays off um, in the long run. We do offer some partial scholarships and you can see those listed here. So if you're interested in our foundation programme, we have an um, ambassador scholarship that gives £2,000 £2,500 discount. If you're coming to us for a bachelor's degree, we have um, what's called the Vice Chancellor's Global Scholarship Award. Um, 
there's 50 scholarships of £4,000 uh, up for grabs that we're giving away this year. And they're giving, they're going to be given away to the, to the highest achieving students. So students that have already got their results um, and have exceeded the intro requirements for, for our programmes. If you're um, a prospective master's student, then we do have our master's scholarship scheme um, where we have general scholarships that are open to any students from any country for any subject. Uh, and then we also have subject specific scholarships. So these are a smaller number of scholarships that our academic schools want to give away to students um, from any country, but they have to be studying or applying to study a specific um, master's degree. Uh, in, in order to get any of those scholarships, you have to first have applied to Reading and been given an offer, um, at which point you'll be invited to apply for those scholarships on the Me at Reading um, applicant portal. If you're interested in studying business with us, the Henley Business School does have a very generous fund of £1 million uh, that they offer um, to students from all around the world. Uh, these are different uh, values of scholarships that are generally from 2000 up to £8,000 scholarships. All of the scholarships I've mentioned here are awarded as discounts to your tuition fee. So if you are fortunate to get one of those scholarships, you are still expected to cover the remaining balance of your tuition fee, as well as your living costs. So things like accommodation. But that's probably all I want to say on scholarships. All of the information I've provided here today is also available on our website, um, including terms and conditions. Um, so do go and have a read of that um, at your leisure. So we're coming towards the end of the presentation. I've just got a few more slides left, but one thing I wanted to mention that I think is a fantastic uh, initiative that the, the UK government has brought in uh, again uh, is the graduate route. So some of you might have already heard of this, some of you might not have done. Um, the graduate route, also known as the post-study work route, um, this allows international students to come and study in the UK and then when they graduate to stay in the UK after they've graduated to search for a job. Now, we used to have the post-study work visa a few years back, and then we had a change in our government, we decided to remove this option for international students. Um, but I'm pleased to say that this graduate route has just reopened. So uh, applications have just started to come in from the 1st of July for students currently in the UK who want to apply to stay in the UK um, for a job. So if you study a bachelor or a master's with us um, this year or next year, once you graduate, you can apply for the graduate route, which does require another application, including an application fee. Um, but it will allow you to stay in the UK for up to two years to search for a job. Once you find a job, you can then switch to um, a different visa category. If you're a PhD student, um, you're lucky enough that you can actually stay for three years after you graduate. Um, so it really does give you some, um, some good time to, to find the right job for you. So it's a really positive mood and we're really happy um, that the government has come back around to the original way of thinking. Now, two other points to, to, to make. Um, the university doesn't sponsor you um, on the graduate route. We'll sponsor you when you study with us, so on the student route. Uh, but once you graduate, we don't sponsor you any longer. But we do notify the UK VI, so UK Visas and Immigration, once you graduate so that they know that you're eligible for the graduate route. The other thing is the graduate route, once you're on it, does not count towards your settlement. So you can't stay in the UK um, on the graduate route and use that as a way to um, achieve the number of years to be able to stay in the UK to, to, to live. Now, the I know that we've got Kat here from UNICEF. You might want to say a bit more about this um, when I finish my presentation. Um, it can be quite tricky navigating the, the visas and the immigration uh, matters. So please, please, please do contact uh, UNICEF and 
and benefit from the knowledge and expertise that CAT has in helping you um, navigate that process of applying for your visa to study in the UK. So um, for those of you that are planning to come this year, um, whether you've applied to or not, I wanted to give you just a very brief update on how teaching and learning will actually look for you. So as you know, the pandemic has caused lots of um, upheaval. Um, universities basically started teaching students online overnight, when here in the UK, uh, it's almost like the UK closed down completely. Everyone worked from home, uh, students were learning online, pupils in high schools and secondary schools, all studying from home. We've really learned from that and our students have been absolutely fantastic in the way that they've dealt with that. Um, but for students coming with, to us this year, we are planning to have regular face-to-face on-campus sessions, which are supported and complemented with online learning. So we really want students, wherever you are in the world, to come to the UK, to come to the campus, to benefit from that regular face-to-face -face teaching. Now, if it's not possible for you to come to the UK because of travel restrictions in your country or any restrictions that our country, that the UK has imposed on your country, um, then it is possible for you to commence your studies um, online temporarily, but you will still be expected to come to, to, to Reading to complete your studies um, by the end of that academic year. Um, we're hoping that this year we can increase um, the amount of teaching and other activities like seminars and tutorials on campus um, as face-to-face -face sessions compared to what we did last year. But this obviously does entirely depend on the situation here in the UK. We're just finalising our support package for international students. Um, so for those of you that are travelling here this, this, this year, um, there's lots of changes and uh, criteria that you have to meet. If you're travelling from what the government classes as a red list country, so a high risk country in terms of transmission of um, COVID, then in, you are at the moment required to pay to quarantine in a government approved facility. So lots of universities are actually planning to cover the costs for students to quarantine. So we're just finalizing our package right now. So if you have already applied to us, um, you can probably expect uh, an update from us very soon um, about this. One thing that is incredibly positive, um, the last point here on my slide is the vaccination deployment program in the UK has been incredibly successful. So a huge proportion of the UK have had their first and second vaccine. I'm one of those people, I've had both vaccines, I had very mild side effects, but feeling great. I know that I feel quite safe when I'm out there in the public. Um, so we're really happy that the, that vaccine program has worked so well. And the government has recently uh, announced that international students um, who are coming to the UK to study will also be eligible to receive a free vaccine um, if you have already had one in your home country. Um, so you have to be over 18 to get that vaccine, but it's possible for you to get that um, once you arrive here in the UK. Um, so I hope that gives you some reassurance about how we plan to deliver teaching this year. Um, as I said, anything is possible. Um, and as a university, we had to really adapt to change very quickly last year but we've learned a lot from that um, so we really do hope that the year ahead is um, a successful one for all of our students whether they're new or returning students okay almost there. so next steps if you have not yet applied to study at reading and what you've heard today has sparked your interest and you're wanting to apply or find out more please do contact UNICEF, uh, UNICEF who have invited uh, me here today to be part of this um, session can help you with the A to Z. So helping you to find the right course uh, to helping with your visa um, application. If you have already applied to us and you're holding an offer but you haven't accepted it yet, then please do. Uh, we really hope that you wanna come and study with us this year. So please make sure that you accept your offer 
Uh, and if you're required to pay a deposit a part of your um, acceptance, then um, you can do all of that online. Um, I've got a piece here about contacting UNICEF for visa and immigration advice. Um, Kat will talk a bit about that in just a moment. If some of you have applied and you're still, um, you still have some outstanding conditions of your offer, so maybe you're waiting for your uh, transcript or certificate from your university, uh, or you have an English language condition as part of your offer, make sure that you do everything you can to, to meet that offer. And once you have your documents and evidence, send that to admissions. And like I said, if one of your conditions is English language and you have taken the KCSE, please send us your certificate because it's very likely that we can accept that instead of any other English language test that you'd need to do. I've talked about accommodation, so make sure that you're looking at the Me at Reading applicant portal to see what accommodation is available. You can submit your application via the portal as well. Now, um, for those of you that are um, at the stage where you're ready to apply for your visa, um, what you'll need from us is your CAS. Um, so this is your confirmation for acceptance of studies. Um, we will shortly be starting to issue our CAS um, now that we've had this confirmation from the Home Office um, about a few matters. Uh, we will need a copy of the biometric page of your passport in order to issue your CAS. So if you haven't sent that to us already, please send that to our admissions team so that we can speed up the process. But those are the next steps. Um, once you've applied, had your offer, um, you'll also be hearing from us again, where we'll be delivering some more pre-departure webinars um, that are going to be going much more in-depth about what you can expect during Welcome Week. Um, but that's pretty much all I wanted to say today. Um, if you want to book a one-to-one -one meeting with me personally online, then you can do so. If you have a smartphone with you now, just scan the QR code that you can see on your screen. And it will take you to a page where you can book a one-to-one -one with me. Um, but that's pretty much all I wanted to say today. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you found it useful. My contact details are on the screen here in front of you. So I'm going to hand back over to, to Kat and Alicia um, to take you through the next steps. Thanks, Chris. Um, unfortunately, Kat has lost power um oh, no. and so her internet connection has gone down <laughs> okay um so what we're gonna do to answer. okay good so we're, we're trying to get cat back on but i'm not hopeful to be honest um so if there are any now we will schedule uh, another visa session we've got them going on every week so we can make the details of that available and it's just like this online um if you are based in nairobi then we do have a visa talk going on this weekend on Saturday and the venue is Parkland Sports Club. Um, again, I will send a link for that in the chat box. But Chris, if you've got some questions. I think we just need to move. Yeah, yeah, done. There we go, thanks. Um, so do you want me to read out the questions or do you want to read them and I'll answer? Yeah, yes. Sure. Let me read them. Uh, oh, yep, go ahead. Oh, yeah, uh, I would like to know if there, is a, if there are opportunities for undergraduate, especially in agriculture. So the fewer scholarship that covered tuition fee, the, the living expenses and other things. So, okay, so most of the scholarships that offer full tuition fee and living expenses are for master students, the Commonwealth and the Deeming scholarship schemes. Uh, these are mostly masters or PhD students. Uh, undergraduate funding is very sparse in the UK. Um, the only funding that we offer are those £4,000 tuition fee discounts. And like I said, we only have 40, uh, sorry, 50 of those in total that we're giving away this year. So um, all I can suggest is look for sponsorship opportunities in Kenya. There may be organisations, including uh, government organisations, that are willing to sponsor students to study abroad. Um, but I, 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 I can't tell you for definite that I know that there are active schemes offering full scholarships to any student in any subject area. So 
probably all I can say at the moment about scholarships for undergraduate students. All right. But thanks for your question. All right. I know that's the question I have. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. All right. Um, we've got a few questions in the chat asking about where information is on the website about scholarships. Um, our website is super easy to navigate, but what I do, even though I work for the uni, I just Google it. University of Reading scholarships, put it into Google and it will take you directly to the pages that you need. Um, if you give me just one moment, I will have a, a link send i think i can send that in the chat here right now just give me one moment okay so i've just sent a link to everyone in the, um in this call right now um this link takes you to the general landing page where we've got um all of the scholarship schemes that we currently run um, so if you click through whether you're undergraduate or postgraduate, and then you'll find more information about all of the other schemes, um, including all of the specific uh, criteria, terms and conditions. But as I said, it's, it's really important that I portray this message today. Um, full scholarships are incredibly competitive. Um, and if you haven't already received confirmation from Chevening or Commonwealth, this year that you have a full scholarship, then it's unlikely that you were successful. So, but like I said, it's not impossible. Um, keep trying year after year. Um, but if it's just partial um, financial support that you're looking for, then we do offer some um, partial tuition fee discounts that you can apply for. <clears throat> Looks like we've got cat back. Um, <laughs> Sorry, my power <laughs> went. No worries. Um, I'm happy to hand over to you if you want to. Um... Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, I was thrown into darkness. Um, welcome this evening. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I'm Catherine Roberts, and I'm going to give you um, a very brief presentation on the visa application process for UK student visas. Um, so let me just check. I can share my screen and that you can all see it. Hopefully you all have that. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, um, so I don't know if any of you have ever applied before for a student visa for the UK or if you have friends or family that have previously applied to the UK to study. Um, there were some changes that came in um, October last year. So your visa application and the visa that you receive will a little, be a little bit different um, this year. Uh, it used to be the tier four student visa for studying in the UK. So the title of the visa has now changed. It's now simply under the student route. Um, so you no longer receive a tier four student visa, but it's essentially the same thing. There are some rule changes as well. Um, Although it's no longer a tier four student visa, which fell under the points basis, you still do need a certain number of points to qualify for this visa. And that increased from 40 points to 70 points. And I'll go through the, the different point categories and how many you need to qualify for your visa. And there were a few other smaller changes in relation to finances and English language ability. And I'll go through those with you as well. So as I said, the points have now increased from 40 points to 70, and that's broken down into three different categories for your um, acceptance at university, your finances and your English language ability, and I'll go through each of those categories separately, break down the points for you and how you um, qualify for those points towards your visa. So the first 50 points of your 70 is for your CAS, your Certificate of Acceptance for Study. And I don't know if Chris mentioned this in his, in his presentation. So once you've been offered a place on a course, once you've chosen the course that you'd like to do, and you've been offered your place on the course, and you've accepted your unconditional offer, it has to be an unconditional offer, 
your university will then award you your CAS, your Certificate of Acceptance for Study. This is not a physical document, so you don't actually receive a certificate. It's an electronic document that's sent from your university to the team at UK Visa and Immigration that will be assessed in your visa application. So you don't actually receive a certificate. You will receive usually an email from your university with details of your CAS on it. Um, uh, so that will help you validate in your CAS towards your 50 points. So unfortunately, it's not as straightforward as just accepting your offer from your uni and getting your CAS that you automatically get 50 points. Your CAS must be valid. So in order to validate the CAS, the CAS must be in date. So it's only valid for six months at a time. So if you decide to defer your studies, for example, you would have to go back to your university and ask for a new CAS number. Um, otherwise, you have to make your visa application within that six month period, the validity of your CAS. So it has to be in date. You can also not have used your visa, uh, your CAS in a previous visa application. So if you're unfortunate enough to have your visa refused, um, you would have to again go back to your university and ask them for a second CAS number. If you made a second visa application with that same CAS number that you received a refusal from, you would automatically receive a second refusal and then you're into the realms of a third application. And as students, you're on a tight time scale. So that's what we're here at UNISERV to make sure that refusal doesn't happen. Make sure your application's completed correctly, your supporting documents are in order before you go and submit your application. Um, as I say, if you do, re do receive a refusal, um, a refusal, um, it may well then be that you get your visa issued, but it may be too late to start your course. Um, so it's really important that you get your visa application to study in the UK right first time. So it's really, really important that your application is checked before you submit it. Um, you also, in some circumstances, are required to submit the supporting documents that are listed on your CAS, which is usually your academic certificates. Um, and this will go through with you when you come in and see us at UNISERV to check your visa application and help you with your supporting documents. We'll tailor the information to your personal circumstances, your individual circumstances, because no one application is going to be the same. So no two visa applications will be the same. So we'll tailor the information to you and your personal circumstances to make sure that all the documents are in order. So if your CAS is in date, it's never been used in a visa application before, and you have these supporting documents that are listed on your CAS if necessary, you receive the first 50 points towards your 70 for your visa application. So the next set of points is for your money. That's the amount of money that you need to show the that you have to support yourself during your studies in the UK. And the, the amount that you need to show depends on where you're studying in the UK and the course you're studying. So your tuition fees for your first year only are required. If you're doing a three-year undergrad, for example, you only need to show your first year tuition fees. Um, and your tuition fees are set by your university. So university reading. Uh, dependent on the course that you're doing will tell you exactly what the tuition fees are for that course and that's what you need to show with your visa application that you can pay your first year tuition fees if you paid a deposit towards your tuition fees um, you can deduct that from the amount that you need to show and you just show the remainder if you clear your tuition fees in full then you don't need to show anything towards your tuition fees that's cleared you also need to show your first year living expenses in the uk um, again, if it's a three year course, you still only show your first year um, and the amount that you show is dependent on whereabouts in the UK you're studying. So there are different rates for different areas of the UK. So if you're studying, studying in the London area, it's slightly higher than outside London. So the London area is £12,006 for the first year uh, for your living expenses. And outside London is £9,207 for your um, for one year's living expenses in the UK. So you would obviously convert that to your um, currency that you're using in your bank statements, whether that's shillings or dollars. How you show your finances is very, very specific for UK. The money can only be in your name as a student or your parent or legal guardian's name. You cannot use other friends or family 
family members or business accounts um, as evidence of your funds for your student's location. So your name or your parent or legal guardian's name. And if you're using your parent or legal guardian's bank account um, and their bank statements, you must show evidence of your relationship. So birth certificate for parent and court documents um, for your legal guardianship. It has to be an official legal guardianship done through the courts in Kenya, your home country. <clears throat> the bank state, uh, the money must have been in the bank for a minimum period of 28 days prior to, prior to applying for your visa. Um, so you cannot just put the money in the account and then apply for your visa. It has to have been sat in that account, say, for a, at least a month before you make your visa application. And again, we'll tailor this information to you when you come in and see it. So we'll tell you exactly how much you need to show. And if uh, the documents that you have to show it are sufficient for your visa application or if you need to make some changes. So the final 10 points towards your 70 for your visa um, is for your English language ability. You need to be able to satisfy the visa officer that you have a sufficient level of English to follow a course in English in the UK. All, all courses will be taught in English. And whether you need to sit a separate English language test is dependent on where you're studying, which university, and um, the level that you're studying as well. So if you're studying at one of the mainstream universities in the UK, a public university, a higher, they're called higher educational institutions or higher, higher institutions, higher education. Um, the university, and you're studying degree level or above, the university are allowed to assess your English language ability on behalf of UK visas. And they can choose their own method to do that. Um, so they, they may do it through your previous qualifications. Your, they may do a telephone interview with you. They may ask you to sit an IELTS or a TOEFL or a Pearson's test. They will uh, choose the method, and if they're satisfied, they will note on your CAS, your certificate of acceptance of study, that they've assessed your English language ability and they're, they're satisfied that you meet the required level. If you don't fall into that category or you're studying below degree level, then you're required to sit something called a CELT, a Secure English Language Test. Um, you can either do a IELTS, which is run by the British Council, or you can also do a Pearson's, which we run at UNICEF. So you can um, come into our offices, book an appointment for a CELT, your Pearson's test, and we can organise that for you. But again, we will tailor that information to your personal circumstances and we'll tell you exactly what you need to do, whether your university will be assessing your English for you and we'll make on the CAS, um, or whether you need to sit a CELT. If you do need to sit a CELT, it's valid for two years, so you can start thinking about that now and getting that CELT in place, ready for when you apply for your visa. So you have your 70 points, um, so you have your 50 for your valid CAS, and you have 10 for your money, it's in the correct format, and you have the right amount of money in the bank account. You have um, your CELT, or your university has assessed your English, Unfortunately, it's not that straightforward again that you automatically get your visa issued. You also need to sit a, a medical, and the only medical required for the student visa is a TB x-ray, so a TB test. There's only one place that you can do that in Nairobi, and that's the International Office of Migration in Gagiri. The fee is 13,400 shillings, and that's set by the International Office of Migration. They set their own fees. It's valid for six months at a time. Um, so you do need to make sure that it's still valid at the date of travel. So again, you can start getting your TB in place now because you will need an appointment now for your uh, X-ray. Need your ID and you need details of your accommodation in the UK. Um, as I said, it's valid for six months at a time. So again, if you decide to defer your studies or you know you decide to do the first uh, semester distance learning, um, you need 
make sure it's valid or you'll have to renew your TB before you travel. So please do make sure that it is valid. Excuse me, excuse me, Ms. Robert, you, we lost you there. Kindly repeat the tuberculosis. Oh. We lost your network. Sorry, I think my uh, my power is on and off at the moment. Sorry, what? Uh, which part did you hear? Uh, the part where you're explaining about where you should. Uh, they will ask you to go with your ID, and uh, you should. You need to show where you stay in the UK. Okay. Yeah. So when yeah. you go for your um, appointment, um, as I said, you do need an appointment now due to COVID. You can't just walk in anymore. You'll need to take evidence of your payment. So you pay it either the bank and you take the receipt with you or you your M-Pesa receipt. You'll take your ID and then you'll also show evidence of where you're staying in the UK. You'll have to put down your accommodation, whether that's on campus or private accommodations. You need to put your address down. We can help you with the appointment for your medical um, and make sure your documents are in order before you go for your medical. Um, I'm not sure if you heard, so I'll repeat it. If you do, it is only valid for six months. Um, so if you do decide to defer your studies or if you decide to do the first semester distance learning, it has to be valid at the date of travel. So if it does expire before you travel to the UK, you'll have to go and redo your TB x-ray. Um, so just, be, just bear in mind that if you are planning to travel, you can get that in place now because appointments will get booked up. Uh, but if you're planning to defer or start online first, then wait until you know you are going to travel before you get your TB certificate issued. It is only valid for six months at a time. Okay, so the final element of the process is your visa. So you have your 70 points. You have your TB certificate. All is clear. Again, it's not automatic that you get your visa issued you may be selected for interview. Now the, the credibility interview is as it says, it's assessing your credibility as a student. It's, it's satisfying the visa officer that you are a genuine student and that your primary purpose for traveling to the UK is to study. Um, not everybody is interviewed now. Um, so you may not be selected for interview. You may be assessed based on your application and supporting documents. If you are selected at interview, it can be just selection at random, or it be, could be because the visa officer wants to verify something on your application form, um, your previous immigration history, or something in your supporting documents. You may not be notified about your interview, so you may just receive a telephone call, and it will be from a UK visa official um, from the UK or Pretoria. There's, there is normally in the UK, but with COVID, um, some of the work is being, still being done in Pretoria at the moment. But it's a UK visa's official. It will always be held in English, and it's assessing not only your credibility as a student, your genuineness, it's assessing your English language ability as well. So if you are selected for interview, I always say don't worry too much about the interview because you are all genuine students and you'll know about your course and the university that you've chosen and why you've chosen to study in the UK, your previous studies and your career plans. <clears throat> but also don't, don't be too blasé about it. Don't take it too lightly um, because if you haven't prepared for it, just in case you are selected, and the visa officer isn't satisfied um, that you're a genuine student, that you're a serious student, and they can refuse your visa application. Despite having your 70 points, they can still refuse your visa under the credibility grounds. Um, and it's very difficult to overturn a decision if you've been refused um, by interview. So we do offer interview preparation at UNISERV and uh, just again, to your personal circumstances, just to give an idea of the kind of questions that you might be asked based on your circumstances. <clears throat> so when can you apply for your visa? One of the rule changes from October last year was that you can now apply up to six months in advance for your visa rather than the three months as it was previously. This mainly applies to master's students um, who have more time, they get their results much earlier, and then they can make, uh, make their visa application in good time. <clears throat> undergrad students are usually uh, having to wait for their results to come in, which is uh, around now, July, mid-July. And then once you get your results, then you have to um, get your unconditional offer from your university, get your CAS issued, um, and then all that can start eating into that time scale. 
and you have a start date that you have to get to school, uh, which is why um, I will always stress that it's really, really important as a student to get it right first time. If you leave it to the last minute um, or you haven't got your documents in order, uh, it may well be, as I said earlier, that you get your visa refused, but, refused, but it's too late now to start your course. So it's really, really important to start preparing now, uh, ready for when you get that cash from your university, you can make your visa application straight away. So start thinking about your finances, um, if you need an English test, your TB medical, and preparing for your interview just in case you are selected. As I say, as soon as you get your CAS issued, you're good to go and get that visa application in. You do have to wait for an appointment at the visa application centre. Um, so again, they do start getting booked up. Um, currently, the priority visa system is suspended. We are on the standard visa processing times at the moment, which is 15 working days. That's a published customer service um, guideline. They can take much longer than that during the busy student season, which we're now coming into, um, but it can be much quicker. So it, again, it's really, really important that you start preparing now. So as soon as you get your CAS issued, your application is in straight away, because if they do take the 15 working days to process um, or longer, you still have enough time to get to the start of your course. And so it's really, really important to start preparing now. So if your visa is unfortunate enough to be refused, and that's what we're here at UNICEF to make sure that doesn't happen. As I said, you have to begin the whole process again. So you're right back to the beginning. You have to repay your visa fee, which is approximately $500. That's not refunded. Um, and you have to complete a new application form. You have to get a new CAS number from your university. You have to correct whatever was wrong on your first application. So maybe something in your supporting documents you have to change. Um, you have to get a new appointment at the visa application center. And at this point, you may find that you can't get one in time for your visa to be processed. Because as I said, they do get booked up really quickly. And this is the busiest time of year uh, for the UK accepting students and people applying for their student visa. So it's really, really important that this doesn't happen. And as I said, it may well be that you get your visa issued this time, but it might be too late to start your course and your university might ask you to defer either to the next semester or even the following year um, if there isn't an intake um, in the next semester for the course that you want to do. Um, so it's really important to start thinking about these things now and getting all these documents in place. Ready. As soon as you get your CAS, you're good to go. So the common mistakes people make, the main reasons why people get their visa applications refused, I've gone through most of these already. So as I said, not applying early enough. So if you leave it to the last minute, um, as I said, it may well be that your visa is too late to start your course. Applying with an invalid CAS, I uh, talked about what your CAS is, your certificate of acceptance for study, and how to validate the CAS to get that first 50 points towards your 70. Not providing original documents. Um, this is no longer a requirement um, to provide original documents because all applications, um, the documents are now scanned and sent electronically to the visa officer to assess. Um, but I do all, always recommend that you do provide original documents where you can. Um, because the documents are scanned and sent to the visa officer, if they can't read the documents, if you're sending a photocopy, for example, um, they might have to write out to you and ask you to send um, another copy or, or the original of that document so that they can assess your visa application. And all that's going to do is delay your application. So where you can um, use original documents, the documents are not retained anymore at the visa application centre. As I said, they are all scanned and sent electronically. So you will be able to take your documents home with you. You don't have to leave them there um, and have them returned to you once your visa has been assessed. Not providing your TB certificate. So I said, this is the medical for a student visa. It's the only medical that you do need to do. And it's valid for six months. Visa form incomplete. So as I say, this is what we're here to make sure that doesn't happen. All the correct boxes are ticked and all the correct information is provided. No evidence of your English language ability. So as I said, this forms the final 10 points of your 70 to make sure that your English is at a sufficient level to follow a course in the UK insufficient funds. Um, so I talked about how much money you need to show and how you need to show it. 
um, and that forms part of the 70 points as well. So 50 for your CAS, 10 for your money, and 10 for your English to give you the 70 points towards your visa. The final two, not vouched for academic progression and exceeding time limit for study, um, kind of go together. So academic progression is not assessed as an overseas student applying from overseas, um, but it does come under the credibility rule. So if you're not progressing academically as the visa officer wants to see, so secondary education, foundation, if you need to do one, undergrad, master's, PhD should be the natural flow without two big gaps in between your um, courses. Um, they may not consider that, again, that you're a serious student. If you're failing modules, if you're repeating, if you do, uh, if you want to do a second undergrad because you, you know, you want to change your career path, they might not consider you a, a genuine student, a serious student, and therefore that you're not progressing academically, and they can refuse you under the credibility rules, that you're not a genuine serious student. So it's something to think about later down the line. Um, again, exceeding time limit for study. Um, is a similar theme. There are time limits that you can study at different levels in the UK. There's a maximum period that you can um, complete a course in. So for foundation, it's two years. You allow two years to complete that course. And at degree level, it's five years. So again, if you're failing modules, if you're failing exams, you have to repeat a year, or you decide halfway through a course, actually, this isn't for me, I want to change paths and do something else, you might find that your next visa application is refused because you wouldn't be able to complete your course within the remaining time period. So again, it's not so relevant now, but later down the line, it may well be. Um, so two years at foundation level, five years for degree level. Master's students and PhD students, there's no longer a time limit for you to complete those courses in the UK. So this is where we are. I'm sure you all know our offices already. Um, in Nairobi, we're in Westlands on Woodvale Grove, Fortis Tower. Um, the building with the Coldstone Creamery and Domino's downstairs. So you can always find us. Um, you don't need an appointment. You can just call in anytime or drop us an email or give us a call. Um, <clears throat> but, but all our services are completely free. So we don't charge anything to you for our services whatsoever. Um, as I say, you don't need an appointment, you can just drop in and see us. So as soon as you're ready, um, you have your offer from your university, um, whether then to help you with the visa application, but do start preparing now. Or if you're not sure, come in and see us and we can start checking your supporting documents now, ready for when that CAS is issued um, and you can start um, make your application and submit your visa. Okay, so that's it from me. Um, if there's any questions related to visa, pop them in the chat box and I will try and answer. If I can't answer this evening, then I'll come back to you um, through the office tomorrow. Super. Thanks, Catherine. I think I even learned a few things there. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of changes at the moment. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, were there any other questions from anyone um, for myself or Catherine? I've tried to answer as many as the questions that came as I could. I don't think there's the don't can't see any visa questions there. Um, but if anybody has anything, pop it in there now. Or if you think of anything later, then do come back to us. A very quiet group of people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just want to mention I did see some student from Tanzania. Uh, we do have offices in all through East Africa. So if you do want to find the one that's closest to you, you can visit our website. I have put the website in the chat box. You just go to the contact us section um, and you'll see all of our regional offices. Um, there are experts in all of those offices. So any questions that you want to ask, you're more than welcome to. Um, I can see some questions coming in now. So can I still apply for next year? Chris, you want to take that one? Yeah, of course. Um, so applications for undergraduate students to start in 2022 have um, just opened. Um, you can't actually submit yet, but you can start preparing your application. Um, and you can apply for a postgraduate programme now for next year. Um, yeah, 
So yeah, it's absolutely not too late. It's not even too late to apply for this September if you're still interested. Um, and yes, we do have programs in filmmaking. So film, theatre, television, um, lots of different programs. Um, so take a look at the, the website if it's undergraduate, postgraduate, and you'll see what we offer. Um, <clears throat> does Reading have winter 2022 intake? So pretty much all of our programs start in late September or early October every year. So that's undergraduate and postgraduate. If you want to do foundation and international foundation program, you can start in January or in September. Uh, and if you're a PhD student, um, we can basically allow you to start usually at any time throughout the year um, because you're your program isn't necessarily related to taught classes. Uh, thank you for those saying thank you. Um, There's a question there about finances. Um, if somebody's, where's it gone? I've lost it. Uh, if somebody's starting their course in September, do they have to have their finances in their account now for their visa? So. Um, I would, yes, need to start looking to make sure that money's there now. So it depends on the date in September your course is due to start because um, you'd need to make sure you get your, you need to give at least 15 working days for your visa to be processed. So you're looking at August, obviously, depending on the dates. Um, and the, so, yeah, you need to start looking now for your finances. But I'd need to know the exact dates. So, um, so come in and let us and bring your bank statements in and then we can have a look um and um, how we can do that as well to make sure that you've got your money there in place uh, i think we have a question there from fatima milani um what else apart from the biometric page of the passport noting that you applied through ucas um so i don't know what question you're taking um if you're taking the ib or a levels then um, we should receive your results directly from UCAS. Um, so IB results came out earlier this week. A-level results come out in uh, mid-August, well, the 10th of August. Like I said, we get those directly. If you meet the conditions of our offer, um, we can make you conditional. If you've accepted your offer and you've sent us your biometric page of your passport, then you're eligible to receive a CAS. Um, if there's anything that we haven't got from you that we need, then you can be sure that we'll contact you to ask for it. Uh, uh, about what, Sarin? This has a lot of changes from when I last applied in 2019, so I want to take a second master's. I have an unconditional offer. Due to COVID, I took up jobs with NGOs. Does that warrant a visa denial? Um, not necessarily, no. Um, it depends. Uh, it, there's a lot will be taken into account with the visa officers. So your study history, your immigration history, your work history. If you're changing fields um, in your career path, it may what you may find that you're selected for interview just to explain that. And if you can explain, you know, why you've why you're changing, um, then that would sati satisfy the visa officer. Um, if you have a good immigration history, study history, um, and everything like that, they may well not select you for interview, may just be satisfied that the university has accepted you on a new master's, um, and then your visa would be issued. But it may, you may be selected for interview. It's not an automatic re refusal by any means. Um, another question. I think someone's worried that they're too late for a visa for the September 2021 intake. You are absolutely not. Um, like Catherine and I said, sorry, Kat, um, you need a CAS from us at the university before you can even apply for your visa. And we haven't started issuing those CAS to students yet. Um, there's been a few delays because of um, some changes at the home office in the UK that we were waiting for confirmation from. But now that we have them, we're really hoping within the next week or so that we can start issuing those CAS. Yeah, absolutely. So there are still places available at um, UK universities. And as I said, everybody's in the same situation waiting um, for that unconditional offer and their cast to be issued. So you know, get get on to uh, Chris and, and see if he's got a, a place on a course for you. Um, and then, yeah, we can help you with your visa application so that it's everything's in order, ready for when you submit. Abraham, uh, the visa application process looks long. 
It is, but that's why people like Kat, who are absolute experts, are here to help you. So don't be don't be daunted. Uh, I had a it's question. When can I insurance. take my health insurance? Yeah. Oh. Where are we? I'm guessing that's a health surcharge. Is it just asking the fee? Sorry, I can't see the question. Uh, when? When when can I pay for my health insurance? Oh, you, you pay that at the time. It's part of the visa application process. So when you pay your visa fee, the $500 approximate, you also pay the immigration health surcharge at the same time. Um, so it's all, you pay it all together. Uh, another one, also assuming that my tuition fees are £20,000, how much more do I need to add on top of the additional £9,000? Uh, they're the two, they're, for the visa, they're the two figures. So you have your tuition fee and living expenses, if that's what you're referring to. Um, for I mean, you'd have your own personal expenses if that's what you want to take. But in terms of visa, looking, you can cover your first year tuition fees and first year living expenses only. I mean, anything extra you want to take yourself is, is, is for you. I always recommend 10,000 pounds per year is normally more than enough for you to pay for your accommodation, for living costs, but it depends entirely on the style of life that you live. If you like to go out partying and uh, lots of holidays, then you might need a bit more. Um, but if you live quite a humble life um, and you like to cook, yourself then you'll probably find that you don't need quite so much um, additional cash um, there's a question here from Kelvin I think this is one for you Kat, but I'll read it out for you uh, for the TV medical well how do I go about showing proof of my address if I've applied for student accommodation but I haven't okay. received we usually my ask, offer yet? we usually just advise students um, if you haven't got confirmation of accommodation it's just to put your university um, address down on your TB medical. They're not really looking at it in that much detail. They just need to know that you, you do have a plan uh, for when you get to the UK. So your university is usually sufficient if you haven't got confirmed accommodation yet. Okay, a question for you and I, I think here, Kat, from Desmond. Uh, for students with a scholarship, is one still required to provide their financial statements or can the scholarship be proof of payment of the course? If you've got um, proof of scholarship or sponsorship that we have accepted here at the university, when we issue your CAS, it will show your tuition fee as zero. Um, so you won't need to um, show that money in your bank account. Um, but I'll let Kat hand over to what you have to submit to the UKVI. Yeah, so, so as I said, if you've got a university scholarship, um, if it's a partial scholarship, um, it'll say the amount that's on the CAS and then you just show the remainder. Um, again, it depends on whether it covers tuition fees or if it's just tu uh, and you have to still show living expenses. If you have a different kind of scholarship, if it's an uh, international organisation or if it's a government scholarship, again, it depends on whether it's partial or a full scholarship. Um, either way, you would need to show um, an official letter from the company or the government organization with full details of the scholarship on there. And we'll check that letter for you to make sure it's in order. If it's a partial scholarship, you will still need to show the remainder of the tuition fees and living expenses in the same format. So your account, parents account, and it has to have been there 28 days. So it depends on the type of scholarship you've been awarded. Um, I think someone's asking a question about how they'll receive the CAS. Uh, like I said, that comes from us here at the university, usually by email. Um, we will issue those very soon. But in order for you to get one, your offer needs to be unconditional and you need to have accepted your offer firmly. And if you're applying for a postgraduate program with us, that means you have to pay a £1,000 deposit to accept your offer. Uh, Leon, um, in the, uh, I think you're asking for some help with application and other inquiries. My email address is definitely in this chat somewhere, um, so you can contact me directly um, or you can contact um, the UNICEF officers and there's someone that will be more than happy to help you. Uh, Daniel, what happens to someone doing business courses in Kenya currently eligible to apply to study in the UK? Uh, it very much depends on what you're studying now, at what level, and what you want to study in the UK. 
Um, but if you're, let's say, studying a bachelor's degree in business, then you would be um, eligible to come to the UK to study a master's. Um, but every university has different entry criteria, so what they would expect you to have achieved in your bachelor's degree. Um, and I know it's a bit of a wacky thing to say, but it's very uncommon that if you're studying something like business, that you could then apply to study a master's degree in astrophysics. Um, it kind of needs to be related, but that's where the university websites have really useful uh, sections about all of the entry requirements, so what you'd be expected um, to achieve. Okay, from James, I think to Kat, what if I have a past refusal for immigration, does that affect my application? Um, well, it really depends on the reason you were refused um, and when. So I think that's something that you might want to come in and then we can talk about and you can um, can give full details. I'd need to know full details of your refusal. Um, it's not it's not impossible. It's not it's not a, a refusal by any means automatically, but it does depend on why you were refused and when you were refused. Thanks. Um, Bridget's asking, um, her first degree was in communication, but now you'd like to degree in transformational leadership. Will this affect your application? If you've done a bachelor's degree in communication, um, it's quite common for you to apply to study a master's in leadership. Um, so it absolutely doesn't affect your application. It, if anything, it probably helps. It's a really good um, starting point for you. So if you want to know what your options are. Um, based on what you've studied before, then, like I said, get in contact with me or with the UNICEF offices and they can uh, tell you about some of the courses that are available. Uh, Doreen's asking if the undergraduate applications are still available for 2021 intake. Absolutely. Um, a process called clearing, which means that you can apply directly to us here at the university. Um, but please contact someone at UNICEF and they will take you through that whole process um, so helping you to match up um, the programme of interest and the application process. Cool. Uh, okay, I don't want to pronounce this name wrong. I'm going to try. Uh, Salian, um, I, I spoke about the quarantine process. Uh, when do we pay for this? I don't want to give you any uh, incorrect or factually incorrect information. So please visit the government website. Um, which I have open here right now. It's called the red, amber uh, and green list rules for entering the UK. Um, so basically the government here has given each country around the world a colour rating. Um, if you're from a red list country at the moment, you have to quarantine when you arrive. Um, but I have to say, I'm not entirely sure how that works in terms of payments. But also, um, as I've alluded to, we're trying to get a support package in place for students who might be affected um, by these additional costs. So bear with us. If you have applied to us, um, we will hopefully be able to get some information out to you pretty soon. Um, so if we can just ask you to sit tight and be patient, that will be super helpful. Um... So um, to finish a six year cardiology course, how much time do I have to apply for these? Uh, I think it's one for you, Kat. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I fully understand that question. Could you, could you elaborate a little bit more on it? I'm not... Um... I, I'm wondering if it's a six year programme and if they only have five years technically to complete. Oh, sorry, but if, if it's a six yeah. year programme and I think you just yeah. get six years to complete. Yeah, if it's med uh, yeah, sorry, because I did say that there are uh, time limits for completing a degree. There are there are always um, exemptions within um, UK visas. Um, nothing is ever black and white. So there are courses that don't fall under that category of five years. Medicine is one of them, um, which you do get longer to complete that course. So courses like law, um, architecture, medicine, there's some music courses as well um that you are allowed a longer period because they are longer courses you're allowed a longer period so you don't fall under the five-year um maximum period for study um vivian does your university offer a course in exercise science if so are there any scholarship unfortunately we don't 
Um, we have biomedical sciences and biomedical engineering, but we don't offer anything in exercise science, unfortunately. Um, but Loughborough University um, in the UK are very famous for sports, so maybe uh, check them out um, or have a chat with one of the UNICEF counsellors and they can tell you which universities have appropriate courses. Um, James had come back with more information about his refusal. Um, I'd like to see your refusal notice, James. So I don't know if you can call into the office. It's not as you know, nothing set in stone, um, but it certainly would deem it a non straightforward application. So you may well be selected for interview because of your immigration history. But you can come into the office um, and bring a copy of your refusal notice. We can sit down and have a look at it if that's um, if that works for you. Super. Um, we've just had one other question. Do we offer biochemistry courses? Yep. Um, I'm just posting a link to the website. This page uh, is where we have links to all of our programs. So please do go and have a look and see if we offer the program that you're interested in. You'll find lots more information on there than just a yes, no from me right now. Um, so, yep. How is the weather there at the uni? Uh, today it's very sunny. I don't know if you can see, but the sun is shining through the window. It's very nice and maybe a bit unprofessional, but I'm wearing shorts today. So it is quite warm in the UK. Um, but the UK is very famous for having all four seasons in one day. So it was actually raining this morning. Um, so yeah, you definitely have to prepare for all weather occasions in the UK. But we do have a summer, uh, and last summer it was very hot for about three months, and the grass died in our garden. So we do have sun and heat. Uh, <laughs> uh, when does the UK government lift the restrictions on COVID? Does it affect? Yeah, it affects everyone. So any restrictions that are lifted will affect everyone. Um, there were some announcements earlier this week. Um, the, the next date that we're working towards in the UK is the 19th of July, and this is where um, lots of the restrictions are planning to be lifted. So not needing to wear masks in public spaces, social distancing measures, not being a legal requirement. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens at the university. I imagine we'll still have some some of those kind of measures in place just to make sure that we are protecting um, ourselves and one another. Um, if you ever want to read more about the actual realities of what's happening in the UK, the BBC News is a really good place to look. Um, it's a reliable source, uh, and obviously the government website as well. They post um, lots of updates. Uh, do we offer education? Yes, we offer education courses. Um, if you want to be a teacher or if you just want to learn more about education development, yes, we do. So hit the link that I sent above and you'll find the courses that we offer. <coughs> uh, Abraham, what if after your course you want to live in the UK? That's okay. Uh, the graduate route is what you'd need to apply for, which I mentioned earlier. So you've got either two or three years, depending on what level of course you graduated from to find a job, um, which will then allow you to switch to a work visa so that you can stay in the UK. Uh, and I think we've had one person asking if we can help them study in the Ukraine. So I think that that's probably for someone at UNICEF. Um, I can't help you study in the Ukraine, unfortunately. <laughs> Unless it's a yeah. typo and they mean UK. Maybe. I don't know. Ukraine seems a bit random. Well, we can help with both. So <laughs> yeah. drop us an email. Um, again, you'll find our email address in the chat box. Um, and we do have a team that can help you with that. Oh, it is yes. Ukraine. Ukraine. <laughs> okay, super. Um, and okay, just so on the graduate route, when, when, the, when the students do come in and see us uh, with a visa, we will give them, uh, we'll give all the students information on the new graduate route as well um and you know how that works with your student visa as well um once you've completed your studies so we'll 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 talk all about that individually um with students when they come in thank you all so much for your questions this has been one of the best sessions that i've um taken part in for quite some time so thanks to unicef cat for all of thank your you. help as well um 
you've got all of our contact details. I think the recording will be shared with you all. So thanks again for coming. Um, I'm going to say goodbye. I uh, hope to see lots of you in September. Um, and uh, yeah, if you do make it to campus, then do let me know and I'll come and find you and say hello and show you all of the wonderful wildlife on the campus. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll hand back over to, to Alicia now to close. Okay, cool. So thank you so much, Chris. I think it was really great for all of us to um, answers to their questions. I can see there are still a few more coming in. If you email those through to us, um, we have a really good relationship with Chris, so we can always get hold of him um, and arrange another. We can just respond to you by email. Um, but keep up to date with all of our events. We'll be doing these really regularly. Um, if there are any more visa questions, email available all the time. Um, and she's the expert, so she'll definitely have an answer for you. Um, but thanks again for joining today. Thanks, Chris and Kat, for your time. Um, and take care, guys. Hopefully, we'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thanks. Chris. Thank Felicia. you. Thank Stay you. Stay safe. Bye. Get the vaccine. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, Bye-bye.